The last two years, many congregations went without an in-person version of one of the most sacred brethren experiences, Love Feast. It's been hard. Who are we without Love Feast? Love Feast reminds us who we are and whose we are. It really does, Annalisa, and the Dunker Punks virtual Love Feast has tried to fill that role the last two years. We've offered two thoughtful, hopefully worshipful experiences, but this spring, most congregations are preparing to return to an in-person service. So we want to reflect on what it means to get ready. Love Feast includes four elements, preparation, feet washing, agape meal, and communion. Tonight, we are taking preparation seriously, how we prepare for Love Feast and all of these parts of Love Feast. That's right. So tonight will be more of a conversation. A dialogue. We're going to hear from a panel of people in conversation about what it means to prepare for Love Feast. The panel is made up of lay people and pastors, younger adults and less younger adults. <laughs> I think the right term is mature adults, um, but we have a wonderful te team that worked on this. That's right, Jess. And these are some seasoned, beloved, mature adults. People like... Angela Finette, Mountville Church of the Brethren. Matt Riddle, Arlington Church of the Brethren. Gabe Imler, Hollidaysburg Church of the Brethren. Emmett Wachowski Aldred, Hollidaysburg Church of the Brethren. Jacob Krause, Washington City Church of the Brethren. Now I might be biased, but that's a pretty great crew. It is. Tonight we're going to talk about what we love about Love Feast and the work it takes to prepare. But more than that, the work it takes to prepare ourselves to attend. Absolutely. We invite you to the table for conversation. the bread is the flower and back of the flower is the mill and back of the mill is the sun and the rain and God's good will the bread is the flower and back of the flower is the mill and back of the mill is the sun and the rain and God's good will haven't had an in-person love feast in two years it's hard not to ask ourselves the question sort of how do we do this again you know how do we prepare for love feast we got together and one of the first topics was who's bringing the meat I feel like even before we focused a lot on the housekeeping of the details um, but especially in the last two years when things were so different and we were really trying to figure out how are we going to do this? But for me, sometimes the focusing on the details is too much about the how and maybe not enough about the why. Mm. Is that always tension between the how and the why? I, I remember um, 
and I pastored the Franklin Grove Church, the brother, and there was a unanimous decision to try to get to more of the why. And so we thought, uh, what if we stopped making our own communion bread? So I was commissioned from everyone, unanimous decision to go to the store. I went to the locally owned Christian bookstore, shopped the aisle. I, I, I bought what I viewed to be the fanciest communion wafers I could find. We used them once. <laughs> and right after church, with like two minutes later, there was, you know, an impromptu meeting about, <laughs> let's revisit that making communion bread. <laughs> you know, they remembered their why pretty quickly. Uh, these, these sort of like details, the housekeeping details can be affectionate and meaningful sometimes. That that story always brings a smile to me. Uh, but we agree for sure that these details of housekeeping can take up a lot of, a lot of space. Right. Yep. Focusing on the details is great and important as long as it doesn't become some source of division or angst. Um, and it's for me, it's the focusing on the why that gets to the heart of worship. Well, speaking of getting to the heart of worship and communion bread, we're going to hear from uh, Michael Gresh, who's going to do both for us from Long Green Valley Church of the Brethren. Hi, I'm. Michael Gresh. Um, most people call me M. I am 29. I'm the pastor at the Long Green Valley Church of the Brethren. So I wanted to ask what um, the communion bread that you grew up with was like. My first memories were of a rectangular shaped piece of bread about the size of a domino that had a dividing, dividing line through the center of it. And it had either four holes one direction and three holes the other or four holes both ways and some churches are very passionate about it being one way or the other and have special forks that they use to place the indents but as I got older I got exposed to a ton of different ways that people do love feast one being a communal loaf of bread that is baked or bought but usually something kind of crusty, and it's passed around and people tear off pieces. So the first time I experienced the loaf was a big change for me. So then imagine my surprise when I go to my first love feast while I was at seminary, and it's an entirely different setup once again. In that case, they had bread rolls on the tables in baskets and you picked with the person next to you and broke it. And they had different kinds. They had gluten-free, they had like low sugar, different things, but it was all in one basket. So you picked the kind that you and your seat partner could share. And I think that we're seeing that a lot more with different kinds of communion bread being available as dietary restrictions are more commonly talked about. And I think it's really a great move forward in terms of bringing everyone to the table. I'm curious if you know or are aware of who the communion bread makers in your life have been and what do you think was the significance to them of participating in Love Feast in that way? So in my first congregation that I remember, that was the Rummel Church of the Brethren in Winbur, Pennsylvania. And that was a very closed group of women. You had to be specifically asked to take part in it. I was very, very young and I was not asked. <laughs> but there are a lot of things around Love Feast that sort of happen behind closed doors to prepare for it, to make it seem very effortless. But these women would gather, they'd bake all of the crackers. And I think that it being a closed practice where everyone who was there was very invested in it almost made it similar to intinction methods where in some churches they have blessed the host and the love and the care that was put into making the communion bread. They are I believe it was a form of them putting a little bit of themselves into that bread making. There are other places that I've been that it has not really been thought about very hard. They go and they pick up a loaf of French bread from the local grocery store and 
that's a different approach that isn't any less valid. The fact that Love Feast varies so drastically from church to church to church isn't actually as big of a detraction as it is an asset because the bread might be completely different at Long Green Valley than it was at Rummel. But the meaning carries through no matter what the actual bread is. Sometimes that bread ends up being cinnamon raisin bread. And you know what? That's fine. I, I know that you're a person of a certain culinary prowess yourself. So have you had a chance to make communion bread? So I have not had a chance to make it the way that I grew up eating it. I have tried and I cannot make it taste the same, which it gives me a little bit of a hit to my ego. I think I'm a pretty good cook. Um, but I have baked breads to take to communion before, more traditional breads. A couple of times I have been requested to make cornbread because I can make gluten-free cornbread. And that's apparently a valuable commodity at some love feasts. But in those cases, I was usually making it alone. And I don't think that it's the same. I really don't. I think that engaging in it together as a group, and I don't think it needs to just be women. There are some fantastic men who can cook with the best of them. I think having a group of people gather to create the bread is more important than just having the bread. Of course, it's not like there's one bucket of doing and a whole separate bucket of being. Really, it's it's often not that clean. Um, with what we just heard about communion bread, you know, there's kneading, there's taking the fork and poking the little holes in them so it bakes evenly. There's the baking itself, there's the slicing, the wrapping it up into napkins and placing it on a table. Then also there comes nourishment, the breaking of the bread and the togetherness that all of that fosters. And so even the act of stepping up and making the communion bread, to me, that sometimes can be inseparable, the, the how and the why. Sometimes those end up being part of the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree with that, Emmett. And uh, the act of breaking as well is just something that can create so many memories, so many vivid memories. Um, I mentioned to my mom that I was going to be on the podcast and, and some of the topics that we had. And uh, she reminded me of this time where we were breaking bread together and I guess I just got a better hold on the bread than she did. I don't know how that happens, but uh, we broke the bread and she got maybe a quarter of the wafer, probably less, honestly. It was dangerously close to crumbling in her fingers. And uh, and we're sitting there trying not to laugh. And of course, I'm trying not to laugh while also really munching on this uh, communion bread. And it just became one of those special memories that we talk about every now and then it comes up, you know, it was something that we, we cherish. We were there and we were together and we were fellowshipping together and we just knew it was going to be one of those times to cherish in the future. I love that. It's like the wish bonification of communion bread. Yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness. And that reminds me, uh, just more memories from Love Feast. So many fantastic memories, but uh, one in particular is probably my first Love Feast. Uh, the first time I went in to wash feet, uh, I went in with my dad and I remember dad telling me beforehand, you know, you're going to go in, you're going to be pretty silent and uh, whoever they pair you with, you're going to wash their feet and just kind of go through the motions and that's how you do it. That's how you do it. Don't freak out. <laughs> And as luck would have it, uh, I was paired with my dad. And so he went first, he washed my feet, we hugged, uh, we traded places and I washed his feet and we hugged again. And both of those hugs, I remember, were those quick, tight hugs uh, that just meant meant a lot. They, they kind of solidified the significance of, of the evening. And it was very powerful. It was uh, a moment that I, I will definitely treasure, one where I can clearly remember the Holy Spirit moving. Yeah, something that that stands out to me from these stories is just like the childlike joy that that you bring to love feasts, as well as that sense of wonder. I feel like that anytime you're around a 
a kid, you never know what's going to happen from them. And, and definitely when, when you're a kid yourself, you have no idea what's going on. And so, especially at a, at an event like love feast, there's just so much joy, but also mystery and, and it's just stepping into a new experience. Uh, this, this reminds me, Gabe, of when I got a similar pep talk from my dad, you know, really every time, especially when we, when we were young and coming to love feast, he would have this talking to with my, my brother and I, and he would, you know, pretty sternly warn us not to start giggling when our feet were being washed. Um, he knew that we had ticklish feet and that it was, it was always likely to happen. And he always reminded us, no matter whose crusty old feet you get, you're going to stoop down and you're going to wash them. And you're going to, you're going to treat this as seriously as it deserves to be treated. And then he knew that we weren't, we weren't all that serious of, of children. Um, and you know, that is a form of preparation unto itself. What does it mean to bring a child up in the church? And what does it mean to bring a child to love feast? What does it mean to bring maybe even a child who's even younger than, than we were into that space? What does it mean to, to cultivate within children that the, the space, not to suppress that mystery and that wonder and that joy that, that makes being a, a child so special, but you know, to open up that, that, that new receptivity to, to being in a sacred space and, and what that means. And, and then what does it mean to grow into full membership of a community by stepping into that? So to talk a little bit more about that, we're going to hear from Lauren Sag Saganos Cohen from Pomona Fellowship Church of the Brethren and Audrey Hollenberg Duffy from Oakton Church of the Brethren. Hi, I am Lauren Saganis Cohen, pastor of Pomona Fellowship Church of the Brethren. And I'm here with my friend who I'm going to allow her to introduce herself. <laughs> I'm Audrey Hollenberg Duffy, and I'm pastor at the Oakton Church of the Brethren in Virginia. So Audrey, uh, you and I are here to talk a little bit about preparations for Love Feast. Um, it's currently the end of March 2022. And as we are both pastors, we are both in preparations for our congregations to celebrate Love Feast during Holy Week this year on Monday, Thursday. Um, but an, an extra special piece for both of us is that we are also moms. And um, I found myself thinking about Love Feast as a mom for the first time this year. And not only am I, you know, preparing for my congregation to have a meaningful service on Monday Thursday, but I'm preparing or thinking about how to prepare for um, Love Feast as a parent. Um, you know, my my son is about eight and a half months right now, so he's still a, quite a little guy. Um, mm -hmm. And Audrey, you have um, a three-year-old, and um, you're also expecting another one in a few months as well. Mm -hmm. So I would love to hear from you as pastor mom as a pastor parent um how you and uh tim have thought about love feast and prepared for love feast um with little ones if you have thought about that at all i'd love to hear your story yeah so anita is my daughter and um she was one um she had just turned one at the beginning of the pandemic so we had one what I would call fairly traditional love feast experience with her prior to pandemic. And then, you know, had the pandemic experience where you're just figuring it out and doing creative things. So we had a couple yes. of those. <laughs> and then um, we've had one love feast in person since the pandemic. So I've got several varieties of experiences of, of, being pastor mom, um, you know, with the, with the added responsibility that I'm in co-ministry with my husband, um, so that we're, we're both navigate that responsibility. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've kind of done it multiple ways where we've, um, the very first love feast we did at our, our congregation when she was born, um, she was in the nursery and completely separate. Mm -hmm. um, but since then we've had to get creative because we didn't have childcare when we were doing zoom love feast as a congregation. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> so we had to figure out how to, how to both honor the fact that we were working from home, 
having a toddler and trying to create this sacred space. Um, and then ironically, when we finally had our first love feast back in person, um, Tim and I were so focused on the details of the love feast that we completely missed the fact that we would need childcare potentially. <laughs> so at the last minute, we just kind of changed the tone of love feast and said, well, our kid's going to be there. So anybody can bring their kids and we're just going to make it work. Um, so yeah, some, some of the preparation has been more intentional than, than others. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's, um, obviously a huge factor to think about the age of your children. Um, you know, w- when they're very tiny, you know, when they're infants, um, they require a certain amount of care. Um, but also like the way I'm thinking about love feast this year with him is, um, he's just going to stay home. He's going to be, um, at home with my husband. Um, because we, as much as I would love for both of them to be there, it's evenings are really tough. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, bedtime routines are important establishing, you know, this early. (laughs) And when you're not guaranteed to sleep through the night that young, you know, you want your bedtime routine to be as, uh, as consistent as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're in a place right now where we don't have a nursery. We don't have access to a nursery or a nursery staff. And, mm-hmm. um, and we also live about 30 minutes away from, from where our congregation worships. And so, um, just makes all the other factors, you know, all those factors are complicating. That's just something that I've kind of come to the conclusion to this mm-hmm. year in preparation for it. But then, you know, in the future, I'd love to find ways to include, um, my son if possible I mean I have memories of when I was young um you know being at church when my parents went to love feast but being in the separate you know the the nursery or the kids corner or whatever and um and I remember uh people bringing communion to those who were serving in the nursery Hmm. and then being the good brother and kids that we were, you know, well, we all get the leftover communion bread afterwards, whether or not we're like being reverent about it or not. You know? <laughs> um, so I, I can remember that. Um, so, but then it would be interesting to think about um, what would a love feast look like when there are children actually involved um, and not just here, but they're in the nursery or they're in like a a children's ministry, but they're part of the service. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it was, it was interesting that that first love feast where Anita was there, um, we were, we were still being pretty cautious with COVID. Mm -hmm. So um, we decided not to do love feast inside. We had it outside, moved our tables and food outside, but, um, as we were looking at the weather preparing for that, it was going to be like in the fifties and windy. Mm, <laughs> and so we ideal. decided at the last minute not to do feet washing. Cause we didn't want people to have to take off socks and shoes when it was already cold outside and, mm. you know, expose themselves to the elements. So instead we just completely adapted and only did hand washing. Um, and so we went out and bought a bunch of, um, like sanitized hand towels. And I think because we already were having to adapt how things were done anyway, um, the fact that kids were there and participating in it, um, it was perfectly fine. And, and, you know, we did the extra effort of connecting theologically and meaningfully for why it was okay that we were doing the hand washing. So in some ways we did more explaining about the meaning and the symbols than we would do at just a traditional love feast, which Mm -hmm. made it so that the kids could feel like they were a part of it um, and getting the explanation and why, why we do these kinds of things. Um, And it was so meaningful to some people that they were like, well, we should just keep doing it this way. Mm. (laughs) We can talk about that, but yeah, the, um, you know, I was positioned next to my daughter and, um, I washed her hands and then helped her wash, um, someone that was in their probably late eighties, early nineties that was standing next to her. So, I mean, it was a, 
I know there's, there's been conversations about, you know, waiting until kids are baptized before they participate right. in these. And I, and I see the value of that just in terms of maturity and understanding, but there was something special about witnessing a three-year-old kind of get the reverence of the moment, even if she wasn't fully understanding all the parts that I think is, is special when you do include the kids. And then you don't have to worry about the nursery workers that are missing out on the full experience because everyone's just there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. That's, um, that's a really beautiful image of you and your daughter and your member who in the, all the different age ranges, um, the beauty that that can bring to a service as meaningful as love feast. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think in some ways the experience of trying to navigate love feast and other things during pandemic has just made us more open to being flexible and seeing the, the you know the intrinsic value in the practices that don't always need to be practiced the same exact way um, out, of, out of necessity and now maybe we can continue to <laughs> be creative and and find the meaning without it always needing to look exactly the same yes yeah. Amen. Um, I will say it's also a significant challenge to be a parent of a young child and trying to create an experience for a whole congregation. Mm. Right? That is not, that takes a lot of being two places at once, right? You're, you've got yeah. two hats on at the same time. And when your toddler you know, is hungry um, and doesn't realize that, you know, okay, mommy needs to go up to the microphone <laughs> and say this important thing. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a dual responsibility there that don't always work cooperatively, just as much as like, I loved the piece where Anita was totally in it and experiencing it. Um, you know, there's a, a certain amount of having the toddler there pulls you out of being able to create a sacred space sometimes and grace for yourself and grace from the congregation to be in that place is important too. Yes. Yes. Um, with the pandemic, you know, we haven't had uh, consistent in-person worship um, since Leo was born. Um, so he hasn't been to a ton of worship services so far, but there have been a few where um, he's been in worship and my husband has been, you know, caring for him during the service and, you know, he'll, you know, make a noise or he'll cry or something. And, and I'm at the pulpit and, um, and of course the, the gut response from everyone in the congregation is we don't care about the noises he makes. We love right. it. You know, we love having him. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I always say how grateful I am for that. And it feels different when you're the, you're the parent at the pulpit, hearing your own kid mm -hmm. <laughs> making those noises or fussing or whatever. Right. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I want to be able to leave my congregation in this, you know, reverent and, you know, professional way um, that, that, that serves the congregation that serves God and providing this worshipful space. And I just, I, I'm a parent too. I'm a mom too. And I just, I always have that pull. Um, yeah. And I also, I just want to acknowledge one of the other differences between our situations is um, both you and your spouse are co-pastors of your congregation and co-parents <laughs> to <laughs> your little ones. Um, and in my situation, my spouse is not co-pastoring with me. He's not in ministry. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there are times when um, I just have to say, like, it's easier if you stay home with them today. Yeah. Um, and I'm able to do that. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and you two don't have that, uh, that possibility a lot of the time, um, because you're, yeah, you're we co relied a lot on grandparents. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, in the, the heart of COVID that wasn't even a possibility. And yeah. so, yeah, for the, the first love feast we did on zoom, um, I, we had two computers logged in. One of us was with our daughter in another room of the house um, participating passively. And then the other person was in another part of the house actively participating. And then we would flip flop at different parts of the service. So that, you know, yeah, yeah, you, you, it takes a lot of, uh, intentional planning to, and then, and then, you know, God 
God love them, the congregants say, oh, you guys did such a good job. And I, and I appreciate that feedback while also at the same time, like wanting people to recognize that this is not easy. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yes. Like, like it was chaos on your end. Yes. You, you, you were, you were able to portray it in a way that it didn't come across as chaos to the folks participating. But at the end of it, you're like, how do we make it through that? We did it. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> <Yikes. exactly>. ah. <laughs> yeah. And like, and I don't, I don't like feeling like that because then I, no. I'm not a full participant yeah. in the moment either. Yeah. Yep. So many factors. Um, yep. <laughs> When I was a kid, I just wondered why no one knew how to spell soup. S-O-U-P. No, come on, Matt. That's how you spell it. Matt, the traditional meal is called sop. It's, it's sop. Annalisa just said they served soup, though. Should I explain it to him? No, you. No, you. I need one of you to explain it to me. Matt, there's no you. I'm right here. Sop. (laughs) We don't eat soup. We eat sop. There's no you. There's no letter you. (laughs) There's no I in team, and there's no you in sop. Well, I mean, however you spell it, at least we can all agree that SOP is pretty much the best part of Love Feast, right? That is the thing that I look forward to every single year. In fact, I think it's the main way that my parents entice me to come. Gabe, I, I think that you probably remember this, that we were we were pretty notorious at the uh, at, at, at our church for, for our love of SOP. Um, we would come in and that aroma just hits you as you as you walk into the building. Um, and you have this uh, you have this delightfully enticing bowl of shredded up bread and shredded up meat just sitting there together. Um, and the very best part of it all was the golden elixir, this hot pitcher of broth that just sits there so tantalizingly. Um, I think that we we garnered quite the reputation at church for um, sneak, sneaking some of that in the form of uh, pouring it right into our styrofoam cups and, and just enjoying. Um, really, um, we would call it beef tea, and I would say that it's the best part of the, the Christian calendar is, is that day of walking in and getting to imbibe on some beef tea. Oh, absolutely. You don't have love feast without a nice hot glass of beef tea. Uh, and you had to sneak it. You had to sneak it really quick or your parents were going to scold you at some point in the evening for it because that was just, that cup was for water. It's like stealing soda at Panera. Um, <laughs> I can remember, you know, we tried to, we, we loved SOP so much, we tried to get the school cafeteria to serve it because it would have been so much better than anything else that we had at school. And you even remember some of our friends wanted to start a SOP store. Oh yeah, I remember we typed up a business plan and the whole thing. The problem is it's called SOP and that is not the best branding, I'll admit it, but it just tastes so good. I'm sure that we can make it work. It is so funny to hear you talk about love and sop. There is not a single ingredient in there that my doctor would approve of me eating. I mean, my feeling is, you know, sop's good and all, but if you're going to have a traditional food that's meat and bread, why not let me make you a pulled pork sandwich? I know pulled pork sandwiches would be like an upgrade for some people's palates, but like hearing the golden elixir of like bone broth, I mean, there's nothing about this conversation that makes my vegetarian heart happy. I'm telling you, man, sop. It's what's for dinner. I love that we can laugh about all this and so thoroughly enjoy our differences. Tracy uh, Rabenstein, a director of mission advancement of the Church of the Brethren. I know you've worn many hats, Tracy, board of churches and districts alike. Uh, I know a cherished role for you is that of daughter and granddaughter to not one or two, but six different deacons. Is that right? Oh, yes. Uh, My parents and all my grandparents, all four were deacons. Over the years, you know, I've heard our PKs or those pastor kids share their experiences about what that life was like for them. And I could really very easily relate to a lot of their stories. 
as kids, we were drug around to various meetings and additional church activities. And I'm sure I probably heard more about church business at an early age than I probably needed to know. But I found that those spaces actually provided me a deeper understanding of the practices of our church than maybe the rest of my friends did at that time. And one of those is around Love Feast. I have very fond memories of preparing for that time. Um, Rock Hill and their sanctuary has those tables that when you're sitting in the pew, it flips right up in front of you. And we would line those with these beautiful white crisp uh, tablecloths with a napkin, this huge silver tablespoon and a glass cup would complete the setting. Two settings at each table with this square wooden piece of wood uh, that had these holes in them. One for a candle, uh, two places to put the grape juice cups and a place to put the communion bread that would be shared and broken later. And then we would get out the basins and the towels and um, get, get those areas designated for feet washing ready. And, you know, it just, it's really just allowed me to have a, a fun, such a special feeling when it comes this time of year. Um, and, and more so because of how I got to learn a lot of this from our church elders. Hmm. It's a beautiful description of how we prepare the items and the space for love feast, but that also opens up an internal preparation uh, I have to ask, though, since you're such a fan of of SOP, did you ever help prepare the SOP? No, well, I not in the making of it. Um, I watched as that pr that process took place, but I did serve it. Um, my sister and I would take these tray serving trays that would have five or six bowls on them, and our job was to put the oyster crackers down in the bottom first, and then we would take it over to get the beef put in next, and eventually then the nice hot warm broth. And then we would walk up the stairs into the sanctuary and um, serve everyone until each person had a bowl in front of them. Well, preparing, serving, it, it sounds like you were a, a budding uh, caretaker of the faith yourself by, by one label or another, uh, which is what deacons have always and still do uh, in all of community life, but also with Love Feast. They prepare for Love Feast. And one way that they used to do that was called the deacon's visit. Um, now, you and I know what that is, but in case anyone's listening that doesn't, could you say more about that? Well, I the way I understand the, the deacon visit um, it was to happen prior to Love Feast, and this is where a deacon would come to your home and ask if there were any issues or conflicts that might be going on with anyone else in the congregation that need to be addressed. And they would work at this through what we term a, a Matthew 18 process to try to find resolution. Well, the Matthew 18 reference is specific to verses 15 through 17 of that 18th chapter, and it's where you would start a process by addressing the individual you have a problem with one-on-one. -on -one. And if that issue wasn't resolved, you would bring in one or two other members from the church to help facilitate conversation and work towards resolution. In fact, if I understand this right, if conflict couldn't be resolved through those visits and the various follow-ups, the congregation would not hold love feast until those things have been resolved. I learned when I took the brother in history class that uh, we have a recorded instance of that happening at least one time. Um, I know you had two parents and then four grandparents who would have practiced and performed these deacon visits for the community members. Uh, so I'm curious, since you're so qualified, if you could help us understand the role of these visits in our modern day culture, sometimes we shy away from the word of like accountability and and so there can you help uh walk us through this is this an opportunity for deacons to point a finger mm -hmm. and offer shame about a behavior or or do you think the practice of this was more commonly to be a conversation to be restorative yeah my understanding that it's to be it was that of restoration um that early in our history it wasn't you know uncommon for our families to travel great distances to be together for worship and they'd spend an entire day together and I, you know, you think about the mode of transportation they use, the fact that they lived so far apart in those, some of those rural areas, it makes sense that they would make a day out of worship. And so when you think about that in terms of community, I can't imagine this being 
any other, there be any other reason um, for this practice to, to be anything more than helping to hold one another accountable and work at healing and restoration of relationships within the community. Now saying that, I think that's something that's been lost to my generation and, and definitely those coming in behind. Um, we're just not holding one another accountable for the way that we live and the things that we say, the way that we act towards one another. It's really not a practice that we hold quite as sacred or have as a part of our preparations um, for our love feast. I, I'm not sure that we count the cost the same way that our early brethren did. I think, unfortunately, we become maybe more afraid of, of what now has been termed that cancel culture because we're afraid of how someone's going to react, that we may become ostracized from the community or from the relationship itself if we would speak to someone about a concern. And I, I get that to a certain extent. I understand that fear to a certain point because I myself am not going to respond well probably in the moment of hearing someone calling me out on something that I may have said or so a way I reacted in some way against someone else that, that really didn't align with with Christ's teachings to love one another. But I can speak from some personal experience that one of the reasons that I'm still a follower of Christ is because someone early on who loved me dearly called me out um, in a certain situation that I had gotten myself into. And it was truly done in love. It, I, I'm pretty sure I was upset at the beginning because it, in a sense, it did feel like, oh, well, they're what. You know, you can need to pull the, the uh, stick out of your own eye uh, before you look at me. But when you really sat and I allowed myself to sit with that for a little bit, I realized that where I was heading was actually taking me away from God instead of keeping me and restoring me into him. So when I think about that, um, that whole restoration piece, I do wonder if, if there's more, a, more of a parallel to that practice that the deacons did to what Christ did for us on the cross. Hmm. I like so much about what you're saying about um, relationship and, and faith being a mirror sort of. Um, and then you said, that's kind of like what Christ did us for, on the cross. Can you say some more about that? Well, I really am. I'm staying intentional around that restoring relationship piece of it because, you know, John 3, 16, saying God uh, so loved the world. He loved us so much that he sent Jesus to be that sacrifice for our transgressions. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's that intentionality of restoring relationship. Um, it's, it's our way, our direct line to God um, through Jesus Christ, through that sacrifice. And sometimes we may feel like it's, too high of a price to pay to accept it um, because it does hold us to a, a certain level of accountability of how we how we how we reflect God to others mm. and that's not always easy to do especially the way things are today I know we always want to think that we're our best selves but um, sometimes we might have to take that hard look in the mirror uh, through our own faith or through the eyes of a loved one telling us that we've hurt them perhaps, or they're seeing something in us to say, am I reflecting God? Well, um, it's a beautiful vision you've cast for what those deacon visits might've been in, in the best of, of days and experiences. And, and it almost makes me uh, a little sad. Usually I think I'm thankful, but uh, regardless, the deacon's visit is more uh, something we learn about in brother in history than what most churches practice today. Um, but we want to take the best parts of our lineage, faith lineage of our past and apply them to today. So what, what can we glean? What can we learn from this practice for how we approach this coming love feast? Well, I think it, it does, it circles back around to the greatest commandment to love one another and then asking the question of how are we doing that? You know, in this time that we're living in, we still have a pandemic looming over us. We have this uh, economic upheaval going on, of course, environmental changes and disruption and the war over in the Ukraine and Russia. There's just a lot of things that 
from a, from a standpoint of scripture, we recognize some of this as, as things that would be occurring in the latter days. And so for me, that begins to, I, I start asking those questions then. Well, if our day of salvation is closer at hand than it has been, what are we doing to prepare for that? And how are we discipling and being with others, coming in alongside them to prepare them, um, especially if when Christ does return, they're still here. Um, so how are we being intentional about sharing the good news of our risen Savior so that others might find that peace and love and the restoration that we experience each time that we seek him? Um, you know, I served as moderator in the Southern Pennsylvania District in 2019, or 2015, and the theme I selected at that time was preparing the way home, build, love, and pray. And I feel like seven years later, that sentiment really hasn't changed. That call hasn't changed to the church. But in order for us to be able to do that, to even help someone else or show someone else God through us, I think we have to be working internally at that restoration, whether that's within our congregations, within our districts, and across the denomination. Mm -hmm. Well, Tracy, as we close this conversation about the deacon visit, what it means to prepare the way to love feast. Uh, for some of us, love feast can feel like a home. For others, it might be their first time. I wondered, I wanted to invite you to say a prayer for us as we try to be a little more intentional, try to prepare our way to the table where we remember the Lord's Supper especially remembering for some of us, this might be our first in-person love feast in two years. Tracy, can you help us prepare the way? Well, I'll do my best, Matt. Let us come to prayer. Father God, as we align our daily habits to a posture of preparation and the tangible details, help us to first align our posture of our hearts in the sacred details. Before the meal is prepared, the water warmed and poured into buckets, the communion bread made and juice purchased, may we take time to count the cost. Help us find space to deal with anything that may be hindering us from coming around your table. Provide us insight into how we feel towards our brothers and sisters and whether there are items that we need to deal with. Open our eyes to our personal lives and help us identify where we have fallen short. It's not easy to be open and vulnerable, to allow ourselves to examine our life choices, our speech, our thoughts, our actions, our social media posts. We feel a certain level of privilege that we have this right to do these things outside of you. Help us remember that upon the day we accepted your gift of salvation and restoration through the shed blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, that our lives were no longer our own, our thoughts, not our thoughts, our ways, not our ways, but instead, Lord, our lives and all that we are are yours. May we work to reflect you through us to those around us whether at the gas pump, the grocery store, maybe at the office or sitting beside us in the pews each week, may our actions and attitudes, thoughts and words bring you the honor and glory. Loving God be with us in these coming weeks as we prepare to gather, whether in person for the first time in two years or through the use of technology or Lord, maybe both. May we be open to your movement, aware of you within us, and we offer this in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Well, Gabby's music just calls me home. Yeah, Gabby is an incredible musician in person. She's been a member of National Youth Cabinet, and she serves as the worship leader at Nuevo Renacer Church of the Brethren. And this song really encapsulated what Love Feast is all about. It's this gathering in community after some time of preparation, asking, is it well with my soul? Is it well with my soul? Yes, that is the question. I know I've never experienced that classic deacon visit before Love Feast, but we do spiritually prepare for Love Feast. We talk about it in the weeks leading up to Love Feast. We read Lenten devotionals. We might have extra prayer in our congregation life or in our personal life. And then when we gather for Love Feast, we gather for a time of prayer and preparation. I am really happy to hear us talking about the internal preparation for Love Feast because focusing on all the practical details just isn't doing it for me anymore. Those housekeeping details, they don't do it for you this year. <laughs> Not this year. I just want to remember the housekeeping of the heart. The housekeeping of the heart. Can you say more about that? Yeah, it's just where you fling open the windows and you let the fresh air in and sweep out the cobwebs and you prepare yourself to be open to that new thing that God is doing. You know, that sounds like spring cleaning and it is the season for spring cleaning, but you're asking us to do a spiritual spring cleaning. Mm -hmm. And this year, this spring, more than before, I feel I'm ready for a spiritual spring cleaning. Yeah. And one of the ways that we do that is by asking ourselves some really good questions. And we are going to do that together now in our shared housekeeping of the heart. Jesse Health from the Washington City Church of the Brethren brings us housekeeping of the heart questions. Who is one person you can talk to when you're feeling lost? Do they calm you? Do they energize you? Do they motivate you? Who is your community? Does being connected to this larger support system help carry your burdens? What is one thing that is weighing you down that if you released it, would lighten your soul. What is something you feel you need to forgive yourself for? Can you name something that is holding you back from reaching your full potential? In this season of your life, where have you noticed the nearness of God? In this season of your life, where are you looking for relief? What do you need to let go of? What do you want to hang on to? What is something you're grieving right now? What does the difference between surviving and thriving mean to you? God wants us to thrive and live a life that oozes joy and kindness. What do you need right now in order to thrive? Bless. 
Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that of We share each other's woes, each other's burdens bear, and often for each other flows the This glorious hope revives our courage by the way, while each in expectation lives and longs to see the day. From sorrow, toil, and pain, and sin, we shall be free, and perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. Of course, what is spring cleaning without the soundtrack? And for that matter, what is love feast without the four part harmony? As we bring our virtual love feast to a close, what from all of you are, are some of the lyrics that call you all home to this spiritual space? Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Seed scattered and sown, wheat gathered and grown. One cup that is shared by all, the living cup, the living bread of God. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. God be with you till we meet again. Loving counsel's guide uphold you. May the shepherd's care enfold you. God be with you till we meet again. Yes, God be with you till we meet again. Hopefully in person, like at annual conference. Or at national youth conference. Or national young adult conference. Or, you know, let's just get coffee when you're passing through town. Absolutely. And I'll see you in a couple weeks when we catch the next Dunker Punks podcast. I'm already looking forward to it. God, God be, be with you till, till we meet again. again. The Dunker Punks podcast ministry is all about lifting up young people's authentic faith stories to start conversations, create connections across traditional barriers, and inspire discipleship. 
Is this ministry meaningful to you? You can build the community. You can sign up for our periodic newsletter. Go to our webpage, www.arlingtoncob.org slash DPP. You can sign up on the right side of the page and you'll get our newsletter two to four times a year. Did you know that each member of every episode team is compensated for their time? Become a Dunker Punks podcast partner if you also value hearing from young adult voices. $150 pays the honorarium for a full show and $50 for an audio contributor, but even just $5 adds up when put together with other donations. And that's what this podcast is all about. Overcoming barriers to come together in faith. Donate at www.arlingtoncob.org slash DPP. Thank you for listening. Thanks to all who contributed. Jacob Kraus creates our music. Suzanne Lay manages production. Arlington Church of the Brethren and On Earth Peace sponsor the show. You can hear our next episode in two weeks, Thriving Together, Congregations for Racial Justice. We are currently recruiting congregational sponsors. Does your home church care about what youth have to say about following Jesus? Do you want to be part of supporting them with a the platform? We are looking for 20 congregations to come together to amplify young voices of faith and to give them opportunities to create and lead. Email us at dpp at arlingtoncob.org for more details, including an informational packet about congregational sponsorships to pass along to your church board. We are currently recruiting a new communications intern. Current and recent secondary education students are eligible for the part-time, remote, paid position sponsored by On Earth Peace. You can work with a non-hierarchical project team of Dunker Punks living across the country to help recruit new voices, get to know the young people who speak up on the show, and help them make connections with their message. Get experience gaining professional skills in interpersonal communications, product production, social media content generation, fundraising, and graphic design. You get to immerse yourself in storytelling and spiritual discourse, promoting reflection, action, service, social justice, advocacy, and creation cared. And you get paid. Email us at dpp at arlingtoncob.org for more details, including a job description for this communications intern position.